So at Angular Seattle, we really want to help kind of build the Angular community in in the Seattle area. So if things like talking is something that's on your to-do list for the for this year for um, you know personal career growth. Um, we definitely want to help encourage that and, and have people come up who are maybe first time speakers or or if you've you know give talks all the time, definitely reach out to us if you're interested in speaking at future events. Um, also we are always looking for hosts. We have meetups every month. Um, at once a quarter we have a event at Google, but uh, the rest of the time we rely on the rest of the community to help um, kind of provide spaces and, and host and sponsor events. So if that's something you're also interested in too, um, stop and, and chat with any of us. Uh, you can find me and I'll point you in the right direction to the rest of the organizers. So um, before we get started tonight with our, our great set of talks, uh, I want to welcome up uh, Mark and Tim from T-Mobile to talk a little bit about what they do here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for coming. First, I want to say welcome to everybody came, uh, who came here today. Uh, it's really cool when a group of like-minded individuals come and, and are really passionate about a, a topic or a technology or a subject, to, and you guys can be able to share that uh, information and knowledge about how you guys apply it and what, what it means to you. So that's really, really cool you guys are here. It took the time to be able to be here today, and thank you for um, coming in and letting us sponsor and letting us host uh, this event because it's, it's really something meaningful full to us. Um, so my name is Mark Matson. Um, I am the senior architect, uh, senior manager for architecture under the digital, uh, digital web space, self-service space. Um, and we use Angular quite frequently in a lot of our, our, our flows and with our new infrastructure and architecture that we're kind of pu um, pulling out. So I think this is uh, very, very close to some of the things that we're doing um, from a T-Mobile standpoint. Uh, some of the things that we're kind of driving into in an innovation and technology perspective. Digital transformation as one of the biggest things that we're trying to uh, move towards is, you know, obviously evolving and, and trying to keep up with the, uh, the, the culture of what's outside of these walls and what's outside of the T-Mobile uh, visibility, right? Being able to integrate in a lot of the open source type things and being able to be, um, you know, champions and sponsors of, of the things that are coming out uh, that are going to be driving that new kind of wave of technology going forward. So super excited to have you guys here. I want to take a little bit of this opportunity to talk about, uh, about what T-Mobile is doing in general, kind of from an infrastructure and architecture and kind of just a digital space and what we're driving towards, and then just kind of T-Mobile in general as well. Um, we are, we are in, a, in, a, in a transition period of making a big shift from kind of the modern, old, legacy platforms that everybody's used to and everybody's kind of been involved in with some of the more legacy, monolithic enterprise solutions that are out there. And obviously with, uh, with the technology and the speed of uh, delivery that we're trying to get to in today's market and day and age, you know, it's got to be quick, it's got to be fast, it's got to be scalable. Um, all of the things that need to go into it to make uh, productivity and, and, and value and, and speed to market is as quick as possible. I mean, obviously we have a lot of competitors. So you know, with that, we've done a huge transformation in kind of the mentality of what we think has been important in terms of how we've done business. It's not about just sustaining your infrastructure and making sure that things work and keeping the lights on. It's about how do you keep up with the rest of the enterprise, rest of the market, rest of the industry. Technology moves, obviously, at the speed of, of the quickest person who can think about the innovations uh, from that perspective, right? And there's always people coming in who are stronger, bigger, faster in terms of how they're innovating, what they're thinking of. Um, from a technology perspective. So uh, some of the things that we're doing at T-Mobile, obviously, are all the cool buzzwords around AI and machine learning. Those are things that we're, we're really starting to kind of focus on. We have groups out there right now and, and applicable use cases of how we've actually taken a lot of that stuff and applied it to some of our care systems to be able to speed up the response times of our, our care groups to be able to say, hey, um, when a customer calls, we have enough analytics around what they're doing to be able to provide back the customer care rep with uh, quick documents or, or reference materials to be able to say, I'm going to be able to um, answer the questions before they even ask them, right? It, it's amazing some of the things that you can do and how you can apply it, and it's about being creative and innovative in that space, right? So there's a lot of other things from the, you know, the, the, the punch phrases and things like that, blockchain and other things that we're, we're really kind of uh, working to develop. But in this space, from a web perspective, uh, the new technologies of how we kind of get to a quicker, faster, more seamless experience for the customer is, is, is the kind of the, the heartbeat of what we're driving towards. So I just want to really say uh, thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, 
T-Mobile has a lot of opportunities in terms of what we're doing and what we're providing back in terms of uh, the community and technology and stuff like that. So uh, if you guys are looking for things in terms of the spaces and, and uh, like to see, like to hear what you, are, what you guys are hearing from some of the people who are presenting tonight, uh, please feel free to come up and talk to people. Uh, thank you very much, Kendrick Burston, for, for putting this together and really driving to try, uh, try to get this. Uh, uh, it's been a little long time coming, but finally it's here. Uh, thank you guys for, for coming out and really uh, uh, being a part of this. So with that, Kendrick. So how many people out here are currently doing Angular development? I know, stupid question. See, not everybody. <clears throat> um, here at T-Mobile, how many people are T-Mobile customers? Wow. Okay. So, T-Mobile.com, that's AngularJS. MyT-Mobile.com, that's AngularJS, Angular 6, and jQuery. There's also Frontline, which is uh, what our customer care reps use. There's also RepDash, when you go into any of our T-Mobile stores and what they have on their uh, uh, tablets. <clears throat> so we're using Angular all throughout our organization, both internal, line of business, and external. We're using a lot of Angular and AngularJS, and we're working our butts off to get off of AngularJS. I know, I loved it too when it was, when it was the hot thing, but it's not the hotness now, right? <clears throat> All right, so um, I just want to bring that up. We do have a swag master over here, Caitlin Ekdahl, one of our uh, premier Angular developers. Um, and she's going to intermittently be coming up and doing quizzes uh, to you. I don't know what they are. Uh, trivia questions of some sort <clears throat> about the talks that you're going to be hearing. And the winners get some of the valuable swag she's got there. I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> so I got over here <coughs> a list of some of the talks that we want to do, as much as we have time to get through. We're going to start off with Siva. I'm not going to say his last name. <laughs> and he's going to be talking about Angular do documentation. Yes, I'll help with my last name. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Kendrick. Um, welcome all, and I'm so excited to be here, I hope. You all are excited, and I make sure not to spoil the excitement. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a full stack developer. Uh, so I, I worked on Angular JS, Angular, and Node.js, and I was a, I am a Java developer. So I can't say was, though, since I have last worked is probably maybe six months back. Uh, but I am a Java, Java developer who turned to a full stack. So, Angular documentation. So how many of you are familiar with clean code principles? Or at least heard of Uncle Bob, Robert Martin? Great. So, <laughs> so when I probably, for those folks, uh, when I started out, the description would be like, when I said Angular documentation, okay, what is this guy talking about? or why is documentation or comments required? Right, um, yes, there is a debatable topic, uh, the, the commenting or writing comments in the code, uh, but there is value at times or at places it's appropriate, not like trivial comments uh, that we want explaining X plus plus is just incrementing my X variable, so those are not valuable. All right, then what am I going to talk about now? So this tool that I'm going to talk about is CompoDoc. Have you guys heard of this name before? Cool, cool, I see, I see, I see quite a bit nods, which is great, because I haven't heard this probably uh, three weeks or four weeks back. I haven't heard about this. It's, I believe it's the coolest tool, and I will explain why. So if you look at this tool, you don't have to write comments for this tool to work. This tool will give you the complete insight of the code, 
that your developers or your team is building. And I wish this has support for JavaScript as well, but it doesn't. It, it only supports TypeScript. Um, but I'll still take it because these days everyone is moving away from JavaScript to TypeScript, which is good. So it's nice. And what's speciality about this top is, about this tool is this is tailor-made for Angular applications, though it works for other TypeScript applications, but this has tailor-made uh, functionalities that help uh, Angular or the content look rich. Okay. So, okay. But you still can write, as I said, you can still write the comments, but the comments got to be in, a, in this supported format. Um, so it doesn't take uh, the format that I'm showing there. Uh, so that's about the introduction of the tool. Before I go to demo, um, any questions or comments? So the supported format, it looks like it's standard Java.com, but it's not an extra asterisk in there? Yeah. Space, space asterisk. Space, space asterisk. Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know, that's weird. Or, or you, I think you can separate that into a separate line. Maybe I wanted to make sure it fits into this one screen. So what you should do is uh, slash to asterisk and then asterisk and then whatever you can write will be uh, the below points. Uh, all right. So yeah, I think I think like not a great deal so far, but allowed this tool. I'll show you why. So once you you generate, this is gonna look like this. And other cool thing about this is you don't need a server. You don't have to download any web server to bring up this view. It's it's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's it's good. So how many of you are actively doing the development, and how many are actually in the design? And you give the design to your team, and they build it, and you are eager to see that code, what they're building, but you don't have time. So I think that's not a binary question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, because that's my experience, oh, probably I'll, I'll keep it to the late. Uh, okay, so I will go to the demo. So before I go to the demo, want to show the installation part or the commands that required for installation. These are trivial. Um, you can have it download, uh, installed as global or you can have it into your source code as a dev dependency. Um, so recommendation is you use it in your source code because at times the version mismatches with your global if you're running multiple projects and if your one of your team members happen to have a comper doc uh, installed within your... It's really small. Can you go back into presentation? Oh, so. But I wanted to... Okay, I'll talk about this and then go. Sorry, folks. I wanted to go to the demo or run the commands and show, but first I stopped to talk about this. Um, of course, my demo will be having this. Uh, how do we... I'll start from this. How do we run the commands? So I already installed... Feel free if you want me to show the installation. It's just trivial. Um, but as I was, I was mentioning about one point where you need to have your um, your local in your project have this local installation. The reason is if you have multiple projects and there could be some issues, that's what they recommend. Like, do not go for the global. Have it have in, a, in your uh, as a dev dependencies to keep the the issues or. Uh, whatever conflicts to minimal. What is NPX? So that's that's what they um, that's the come uh, probably. I don't know exactly. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, so when you install NPM, uh, you also get a couple other things for free, and you didn't even know. Yeah. Um, one of those things is called NPX, and uh, what it allows you to do is, uh, I want you to imagine uh, that you're writing a, a script in your package.json, as you do. 
um, in there, it's like a slightly different environment. You can reference things like uh, ng, or the, the Angular CLI, uh, just by writing ng, and it's great. Um, even if you don't have it installed locally, you can reference it. But if you try to just type ng on the command line, and you don't have it globally installed, uh, bash just throws up and says, what are you doing? That's not, I don't know what that is. That, that, what, 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 what is that? So npx uh, is just this little uh, utility that tells, uh, it like goes inside of your like local node modules, inside the folder, inside the directory that you're running the command from. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna look inside here for ng, uh, and if it's there, I'll run it. So that, that's what it does. Thanks for that. All right, now I will switch to the demo. I'm gonna wipe out the documentation that I have and generate So this is the overview that I get, but sorry, I'm on the readme file. Okay, so show a little weird. Why is it I can't scroll? How do I scroll this? This little bottom there. I can scroll this, but I don't know why I'm not able to scroll this section. Yeah. What is the comment? Sorry. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, this is the full full view. So you you can see the uh, okay. Uh, before that, I will show you clicking on a module. The cool thing is, you can see your your modules. What modules are referencing them, and and the other cool thing that I liked about is, I can see the source code right in there, and other aspect of this tool is it doesn't require for the build to be succeeded or to be success. It just scrapes the, I mean, it just parses the TypeScript files. It uses the AST parser, abstract syntax tree parser, uh, and then generates this documentation. So we can, we can hide, there, there are a few comments like uh, where we can hide this a generator, uh, and then it also gives the documentation coverage. If you see the documentation coverage, I only have, our, our, our project has only 8% uh, of coverage for one of the files, and others are zero, but still I could get a, a, a holistic view of what's going on and how many components my source code has. And, and if you see this title, it generates, uh, it takes the, deep, the folder name, by default, but we can still, we can change it. I will show you how we can change it. So there is an attribute n, and if I give some, I, awesome project. So I, I can change my project name uh, to whatever I want uh, by that command, and I can I can even hide this uh, generator or which generator I use. Like the tool in this case is Compodoc. If I want to look smart, I can take that off and 
and show, show that this is my cool work. But of course, people will find out. And the other thing that I have or uh, that I know about this is, um, I don't know, I don't use themes much, but if you guys are like that, uh, there is an option where you can uh, give that. Uh, I think there are, you know, yeah, you can, you can have your custom themes, uh, but it also supports out of the box uh, some of the themes that Vagrant, Stripe, but you can use your own theme as well, uh, an external theme that you want to. So, yeah, I would, I would like to share my, my personal experience with this tool. Um, and then we will have um, QA. I'll, whatever I can answer, I'll, I'll answer it, else we'll make it as a discussion and I can get back to you. Uh, so I was asking the question before, like, yeah, I was asking the question, so how many of you are, are daily into the code or how many of you want to, uh, you didn't, you don't have enough time, but you still want to see what your team is building. Uh, so that's had been my experience of late, but I want to really contribute or learn from what my team is writing. So learn new things that they've been writing, but excuse, I'm not having, I'm not getting time. <laughs> um, not really an excuse. I'm not, I'm really not getting time or actively uh, contributing the code. I'm looking for tools or searching for tools which can give me a quick glimpse of the code, also help me go into it and see what they're writing, the source code, without me having to download, I mean, without having me search through the IDEs. So this tool helped me a lot uh, in terms of that. And there is another cool tool, ng-rev. So uh, it's, it's good, but it's not as, it's one-time use. Um, you can, that tool is very helpful if you want to see the mappings of how your team is laying the components and how are they having their uh, dependencies mapped and um, so how is your, you are, how we are making our, our angular uh, processor, what we call the, the change detection mechanism, you can you can look into that tool and, um, and see how that change addiction looks. So these two tools will actually help a lot. ng-rev and compo-doc will help a lot um, in getting to know the code or provide your inputs. So that's all I have. Any questions? I'll see if I can answer. Uh, does it support JS doc? Does it support JS doc? Uh, so the question you mean, like when you say that, whether same subject, uh, tool, it's the same tool for reporting. It, uh, yeah, I honestly, I don't know the answer, but this is also, this is a tool. Why do you need a, a separate tool? Uh, so it, it, it does support it to a, a limited. I think there's a few of the um, keywords that you can't use. Uh, it has it up on the CompoDoc website. Yeah, but you can. Uh, it's the yeah. same format as JSDoc, essentially. Um, but TypeScript doesn't like a few of the um, different like decorators you can use in it. So, but 90% yeah. of the functionality is there. Is it compatible with the monorepo that uh, we are using, that Narwhal the, is? Narwhal? I think so, yes, yes, it does. It does, yes, I read about it, yeah, it, it does. So you mentioned about documentation coverage. Uh, what is the criteria of determining that percentage? The criteria is, is your constructors and the the main ng module declarations are they co uh, did you comment those and your public methods and constants are are you have the comments there then the percentage goes up 
is there uh, something inbuilt to give like default comments to certain uh, mm. getters or something? No, 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 no. This tool is just looking at your source code and generating out of it, but it doesn't, yeah. So let's say you have a lot of unit tests. Can you generate documentation from that instead of your comments? Yes. Uh, so if I understand your question correctly, will this tool help me to know how much of the unit tests are covered? Or you're saying, I, I just want the documentation from my unit tests. The documentation from a unit test. I want to use uh, a unit test to document my code. So you are saying, will this tool read your unit tests and generate the documentation? I think he wants to know. have so doc, uh, Java doc comments above each of the unit tests. So he has both executable documentation and exported documentation. Yeah, but, but yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact answer for that, but what I know is from this tool, you can get the, the coverage, how many, what is your test coverage? Um, yeah, there are so many details in, the, in that uh, website, the CompoDoc website. Yeah. So does this, what kind of artifacts does it create? Uh, so like, let's say you're, yeah. what, what does the output look like? Okay, um, yeah. So it generates a folder called documentation. And it's all the HTMLs. Kenrick. So have you wired to your CI process to actually generate the documentation and push it to maybe S3 uh, or something, or? I haven't. Oh, I'm just curious if anyone else. If anyone is. Doing it. How many people are actually using CompoDuck today? One. Because I would think I that, should raise as well. <laughs> I would think you'd want to do that, right? If, and, and, and then have it, so then my, yeah. I'm not like doing this on my local machine as a developer. I can go mm -hmm. to a, a, an endpoint that, shows me all the documentation and it's continuously built as I make changes to the code. Okay. Yeah. Cool. No more questions? Okay. Thank you, yeah. Siva. Thank, thank you so much. Swagmaster, what do you have for us today? Today, our first piece of swag is this lovely I heart coding t-shirt, size large, sorry. <laughs> so my question for you guys is, um, Siva presented a lot of benefits about CompoDoc and documentation, documentation in general. What is one of the specific benefits he listed in his slides? Do y'all remember? Should I, should I open this up to Timo employees or? Okay. Luke. We, we don't need to look at the code. We can just run it and it, it will generate what comments wh where the uh, developers, what they are working on currently. And uh, it, it generates all the comments, what work done, all, all this information without looking at code and all by seeing the site itself. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. <laughs> so how many people are familiar with Narwhal Consulting? Oh, quite a few of you, but there's a lot of people who don't. How many people um, are familiar with the NX uh, workspace, a Angular, Angular extensions or Narwhal extensions for the Angular CLI? Um, uh, mostly T-Mobile. <laughs> okay, so Narwhal created um, an extension to the Angular CI called NX, um, which allows you to do mono repos. And while uh, Siva was giving his presentation about CompoDuck, Dan was whispering in my ear, because Dan over here is one of the Narwhalians. He's our local whale, an ex-Googler. Um, and he was saying that they are they already have plans in uh, incorporating CompoDoc into NX to be able to generate these documentation on the build, on the fly? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, well, I'm, oh, crap. I'm talking. OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, one of my plans, uh, uh, we, we also make something called uh, Angular Console, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit during my talk. Just um, go set up your laptop. OK, fine. Um, Dan's next. I'm next. So anyway, we make something called Angular Console, which is a, a GUI for the Angular CLI, which is nice. Um, anyway, it's a nice slot to generate documentation. So this is one of the things that I've been wanting to do for a while, to like create a little dashboard that shows you what your current workspace looks like in a meaningful way. So here at T-Mobile, uh, one of our new initiatives, a uh, yeah. new architecture that we're developing, is using the NX workspaces monorepo style. Um, and we've been iterating with the Narwhalians on uh, tuning that to our own workspace. So we're very happy with it. And this tool that he's going to talk to you about, the Angular Console. Anybody know anything about Angular Console? OK. So special. So, uh, somebody other than Dan can tell, you, tell us what Angular Console is, and other than Brendan? It's a UI for CLI, for lazy people. Very good. <laughs> Give that guy some swag. <laughs> yeah. Hey, get a cup. Oh, That's no. so great. <laughs> okay, um, this talk isn't like on console per se, but it's more just a talk about like how I made console because uh, it's like made in a exciting way where uh, we deploy console on like Windows, Mac. Linux and as a Visual Studio Code extension, and that's like a it's sort of a daunting thing when I say it out loud. Like that's a lot of platforms, um, and Flux is on, and I don't want that, so I'm gonna take care of that real quick. Um, but uh, you'd be surprised to know that uh, between those platforms, there's only like 200 lines of code that is different, which is uh, really cool. And it took a little bit of cleverness to do that. And so I, this talk is about how you can like architect uh, an Angular CLI application to be cross-platform with all the code sharing that you could possibly want. OK? So that's me. Uh, I'm Daniel. I work for Narwhal. Uh, I like long walks on the beach and some other things. And I don't like celery. Uh, I used to work at Google. Um, Back in the day, when uh, AngularJS was a thing, uh, I used to like run um, the biggest uh, AngularJS server that Google had. It had about 100 Angular apps on it. It's really cool. Um, then I got bored, and so I quit. And I work at Narwhal now, and that's fun. Uh, because we get to make open source things, whereas Google uh, didn't let me. And now we torture Dan on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's Kendrick's favorite activity. Uh, so I know a lot of you don't know what Angular Console looks like, and it's the premise of this talk, so I thought I would have a GIF that sort of shows you what it looks like. Anyway, uh, so this is like a way of like generating a schematic that Angular Console lets you do. Uh, it just runs CLI commands for you, but it gives you a nice GUI, because uh, running CLI commands on Windows sucks, because Windows sucks, and we all know that. And we can just breeze past that without <laughs> saying anything. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, you have this nice GUI, and it lets you pretend you're running a, a modern OS, and it's great. Uh, lets you run things. It almost looks like you have Bash installed. It's great. Uh, but basically, what it does, um, it parses your Angular JSON to know what like uh, Angular projects you have and what CLI applications like are inside of your workspace, and it. Uh, knows what architect definitions are attached to those, so that's how it knows how it's like build an application, or lint an application, or test an application. So that's that's mostly what it does. Like parses your Angular JSON, knows how to do stuff with it. We all clear? Crystal. Okay. So what does it mean for something to be cross-platform? Um, I've touched on this a bit, but it it really means you're compiling like deployable units for a lot of different things. So like, a deployable unit for Windows is an .exe file. We all know and love them. Uh, we install them. Our antivirus complains at us, and then eventually we get it on. It's great. Uh, on Mac, we have DMGs. On Linux, we have a, a crap ton of them, because Linux distros are a dime a dozen. And then uh, for uh, what Angular console targets, which is uh, VS Code, there's a special extension called uh, .vsix, which is a 
the packaging format for a Visual Studio Code extension. So Angular console uh, is built with Electron to launch uh, its desktop variants for uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. And uh, it uses VS Code itself to package its uh, extension for that editor. So uh, I mentioned this before, but uh, all of those executables have almost exactly the same lines of code. You could take a visual differ and it would show you nothing. You'd be very surprised. There's only about 200 lines. Uh, uh, I just pulled up master a couple days ago and it was, it was 200, I'm not lying. Um, and that's the difference, uh, the amount of code difference between like the Mac, uh, the Mac code base and the VS Code code base. But they look very different. So how do we do that? Well, we're gonna talk about it. Yeah. So is the, I'm just trying, I'm wondering who the target audience for Angular console is? Because I would think developers should be pretty familiar with CLI. Uh, you'd think. Uh, um, so what we found, uh, like, it's targeting two audiences. Uh, one is novices, uh, like, who are less familiar. Like, people do, like, start, um, like, Angular for the first time occasionally uh, before they're gurus like us. But it helps it be a lot less daunting. Like, it, uh, it helps you formulate a mental model of, like, what uh, the Angular CLI's, like, model of the world is. Like, uh, it has really shitty documentation. Um, but in the GUI, you can sort of see, like, it has these things that are called projects. And projects correspond to, like, our deployable applications and our reusable libraries. But uh, well, Ram, do you remember every command line switch for uh, find? I'm just curious. Uh, uh, but that, I would that's a valid question. It's the same thing. There are so many different switches and options that you can put into okay. Angular CLI that nobody keeps it all in their head, and they're always having to go look this stuff up. So this, the console here allows you an interface to not have to think about it and actually teach you about things you yeah. didn't know were there. No, I, I totally get why we need UI. <laughs> Just Oh, yeah. It's, it's uh, like for novices to learn, and it's for experts so that they don't have to remember things and misspell things. That, that was my big thing. I, I kept misspelling uh, uh, on push, like I, I didn't remember if it was camel case or something to when you're doing like uh, component change detection and the CLI would just throw up at me and it didn't have like good spell correction so I would just be flubbed. But Angular console has autocomplete so it, it just doesn't happen anymore and that's great. It makes me more productive and less mad at the world. So it's for everybody. You should give it five stars and download it. It's great. Uh, anyway. Plug. 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 Now, this talk, this talk is not about Angular console. It's just a stepping ground. This console is about building things. So uh, what we're going to talk about is extending the CLI to build things besides like Angular JS applications that launch in the browser, because uh, we want to build other things, like node applications that run our server in the background, because Angular console uses a server to uh, read your Angular JSON, like lives on the file system. Somehow we want to build that with the CLI. So we're going to do that. Uh, the second is uh, talking about how to architect like your application so that you can share code across uh, different deployable units because uh, you don't get that out of the box. You have to sort of be clever and like be methodical about setting up your code base so that you can get all this code sharing you want. And then the third is uh, what sort of like interface you want to expose for each platform to implement because there is a bit of platform specific code. Uh, doing things on Linux is a little bit different than doing things on Windows uh, because on Linux you use uh, a slash and, and Windows you use like two forward slashes and it's just a little bit different. So you need some hook in order to make those differences known. So that's what we're going to talk about. Let's get to it. Okay, so um, the CLI has gone through a lot of changes um, these past couple of years. It started off as this big, I don't know, it's just a big code base. Uh, and then starting with Angular CLI 6, it got a big rewrite, just like from the bottom up. Uh, caused some problems at Narwhal because we had written a custom wrapper on the CLI and we had to rewrite the whole thing. That's fine, because it's better now, just way better. We deleted like half of our code base because now uh, the CLI is a lot more piecemeal. Uh, for every single like application you have, you can specify exactly how you want it to be built. By default, uh, it has uh, 
a builder called the Webpack Builder. It bundles your uh, Angular application with Webpack and uh, it launches the browser and it's great. Y'all know and love that one. Uh, but for Angular console, uh, we didn't want to just make a browser app, we also wanted to make a Node.js app and that doesn't come out of the box. So you have to extend the CLI with a builder. So uh, what is a builder? Um, I've said the word a whole bunch of times, but it probably sounds like Greek. Um, really, it's just a really fancy word for, it's a, it's a script, it's, a, it's basically a bash script. Uh, this is the interface, like copied from Angular's code base. Uh, a builder has one method on it called run, and all it does is it gets like some config, you know, based off of like how customizable you want to make it, and it returns an observable with a build event, and all the build event says is whether it succeeded or not. So just, it runs a script and tells you if it went good or bad. That's all it does. Um, so rather than making our own builder, which is, you know, it's a lot of work. We don't like doing work. We like doing, we like using other people's work and taking credit for it. That's what we do as coders. That's what Stack Overflow is for. So uh, in NX, uh, which is the uh, CLI extensions that my company makes, um, we launch with some builders. Uh, we have a builder for launching Node.js applications. Uh, we have a builder for testing with Jest instead of Karma, which is cool. And we have a builder for uh, um, running end-to-end -end tests with Cypress. And these are all things you don't get out of the box, but just by making some builders, uh, you get to do ng test and you get to use a whole different test runner. And it just seems kind of magical. But these builders are the meat and potatoes of how the magic works. So this is, uh, this is uh, I, I took like some liberties deleting some code to disorder it, but this is how NX's node app builder works. So uh, all it does is it takes like the webpack builder that you normally get when you launch a browser app, and it slightly tweaks the config. It tells it like it wants webpack to output common JS because we're running a node application, so we want to use require statements rather than just doing a massive bundle. Um, and it just invokes it and you get a main.js file at the end of it. Um, and that's it, that's how the builder works. Like 10 lines of code, and all of a sudden you can use the Angular CLI to make node applications. So that's a little secret for you. So uh, the next part of this talk is about how do you architect something so that you can share the maximum amount of code? Uh, so to talk about that, let's do a little bit of preface. Like, how would you build something for a specific platform? Like, if I wanted to build something for Windows versus Mac, what is the difference? Uh, well, it really boils down to three common steps that you need to do. First, you need to like build your Angular app. You always need to build it. Uh, you also need uh, to build the platform specific thing. Like, you need to build uh, the Electron app or the VS Code extension app. Uh, we've sort of set those up so that they're, they can be built with the Angular CLI using our builders but you need to build them. Uh, the second is, like, once you've built your uh, browser application, we sort of want, uh, like, pretend we're in Electron. Electron just, like, brings up, like, an instance of Chrome, an empty blank canvas, and we need to point it to a URL so that it can load our beautiful application. So we need to copy over the client, uh, the, the bundled client application that we built into the, uh, the Electron application static assets so that it can you know, host a server and show you like Angular console inside that browser window that it has. And then the last step that you need to do once you have uh, the client bundle um, is you just need to package the application into an EXE or a DMG or a VS Code extension. So very high level things here. You build, you copy, you package. So for Angular console, uh, that looks a little bit like this. Uh, so this is the magic of how we get to share so much code. Um, our entire server is packaged into a reusable library. And so when you're targeting Electron, it just imports that reusable, li uh, that reusable library to, uh, to make its server. VS Code does the same thing. So they get all of that code for free. And it's just a matter of like when they bootstrap the server, they give it some platform platform-specific bindings 
in order to make it run inside the context that it's in. But otherwise, all the code's the same. So you have the server lib, you build the Electron app, you build Angular console. That all goes into this thing called Electron Builder, which builds all of these things for Windows, Mac, and all these different Linux distributions. Or if you're targeting VS Code, you just build the VS Code variants in Angular console. You put it into Microsoft's VSCE, which is the Visual Studio Code extension maker, and it outputs a nice little extension for you. So in this way, we have maximum code reuse. All of our logic is encapsulated within our client application, Angular console itself, and this reusable server that both different distributions use. So uh, on Angular console, we use a, instead of using builders, like I suggested, uh, we took a shortcut. Uh, a shortcut I recommend all of you take, which is just to uh, use Node.js scripts to do your building for you. So this is sort of a translation of this graph we saw before, where these are how we build uh, the Electron, VS Code, and Angular console, uh, Angular CLI apps. Uh, you saw them in this row here. It's just ng builds those things, just invokes the CLI. And so all we need to do to build a VS Code extension is exactly what I said, where we build the VS Code CLI app, we build the Angular console CLI app, and we copy it over. And then when we, we want to package it, we just run VCSE. So it, it's literally like this is taken from the code base. There's no magic here. This is exactly what it looks like. So this is all the code you need to like target every single distribution under the planet. So now let's talk about what each platform uh, specific integration looks like. Because you do need to do something. There's some things like you just can't do with just JavaScript. Uh, the browser APIs are powerful, but not like they're not omniscient. Uh, so there's a couple of things that you'll want to, like to target. Um, one of those things is like a, a file picker. Um, on Windows, picking a file uh, is integrated with Windows Explorer, and it's nice because users know how to use Windows Explorer already. They don't need to like use your custom file picker that you made, which is all confusing. Like they clearly know how to use their platform's file picker. So invoking the platform specific one is a really nice user experience. And so that's why when we were making our interface to like make a platform that Angular console targets, that's one of the APIs we wanted them to implement so that we get a nice, easy to use user experience. Uh, another one that is sort of tricky is spawning a terminal to run commands. Like that's very different on Windows than it is on Linux. On Linux you can sort of just use bash and uh, it works differently than using PowerShell, right? So you need to like encapsulate those differences. So we implement spawning a pseudo terminal in slightly different ways per platform. Uh, on, in Electron versus VS Code, they have different ways to store state. Um, and so you need to like ex uh, implement those things slightly differently too. And so this is this entirely is where the 200 lines of code difference comes from. Just implementing this one interface, and that's it. That's how Angular console is implemented, and that's the whole talk. Great. Hope it was great. Yay. Dan, <clears throat> what what uh, language or framework did you use for your, your interface of co Angular console? TypeScript, TypeScript, TypeScript. Yeah, and oh, we used GraphQL for our server, so that's cool. We have a nice code generator. It takes .GraphQL files and uh, outputs TypeScript so that we get nice typings, so that's cool. Angular console's cool. You guys should all use it. Um, so I guess one question I have is, what's the difference between, you mentioned the builders earlier, what's the difference between like builders and schematics, which do similar things. Yeah, so um, a schematic mostly, like there's a couple kinds of schematics, but by and large, the most popular kind is uh, it just generates code for you. So a schematic just sort of says like, here are some template files, uh, and here are some like things that I want you to replace. Like uh, they'll have like something like underscore underscore name, which will be like, I want it to be the name of the thing I'm generating. So that's mostly what schematics are used for. Whereas a builder is like, 
it's not used for generating code at all. It's just like, this is something that I want you to invoke when I want to get a build artifact. So it's used for, uh, we, uh, the, the CLI uses builders for building and for executing. So when you do ng serve, there's a, there's a builder, I, I don't know why they call it a builder, but it's a builder to like run your Webpack dev server. And so that, that's what a builder's for in that context, building and executing, whereas schematics, it's an overloaded term, but it's mostly made for generating code. Okay, thank you. Yep, good, good. Can you uh, swap the microphone with Prabjot? Swagmaster, what do we have for these people? Well, this time we have a lovely T-Mobile bag. It even has a water bottle holder. Stay hydrated. So my question for you guys is, um, what were the schematics that Dan mentioned that are created by Narwhal, the company that he works for? Two letters. You you know it. <laughs> MX. Yes. So um, earlier I asked how many people are using Angular. How many people are using Angular Seven? One, two, three, f none count. Four, three and a half. Okay. So, <laughs> how many people are using Angular 6? Okay, more. Four. Two. Angular JS. A few sorry souls. <laughs> okay, so this next talk with Prabjot, he's put this together at the last minute. Um, it was kind of a challenge I threw at him. And uh, anybody know what a virtual scroller is? You, uh, sort of. <laughs> okay, so you're in for a treat. Are you on, Prabhat? Is he is he on? I no, I don't hear you. It, Hello. There. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start with it. So I'm trying to load my site. Uh, most of the time I've been working on these pages. So as you can see, it took a while and it's still loading behind the scenes. So there are carousals, accessory carousals, filters, and the item list that's been displaying here. And see, yeah, it takes time. I know. So this is what it is. So how long does it take to go yeah. to the next page? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry to say it, take, it no. took me 13 seconds in total. Go to the next page. Come on. You really want, do, want to do that? <laughs> yeah. Go, go on. This is using paging. We all know what paging is, right? Yeah. Go, go and get the next set of data. Okay. So oh, nice. This uh, is the standard way of websites taking only a small amount of data and, and displaying it on the screen. So, so why it happens? What's the reason behind it? The reason is the DOM. The bigger the DOM is, the more the time it takes to lay out the things because it has to do the calculation to display each and everything on DOM. So, you know, what your scroller is a thing. It's not a thing. I'm sorry. It's uh, Angular de developers develop it so that we can leverage those uh, it functionalities. Comes, it comes for free with the Angular material. So. Yeah, it comes from the Angular material and so that we can leverage those functionalities and display the items as per our needs. So uh, without taking much of your time, what exactly is happening behind the scene? So as you can see, this is uh, like my DOM and the view that I can see, like we most of the time call it frame. So I define my viewport, yeah. 
So I define my viewport using Angular material. I'm, we call it CDK, Compl uh, Component Development Kit. We defined it over here, and whenever the I, uh, whenever the items that, that I'm displaying, we, I scrolled up or down, we remove them and add them as per the need. So this everything is being maintained by the scroller, virtual scroller. I'm not doing anything for it. So most of the functionality is inbuilt. It's just like plug and play. So that's what is happening here. Uh, let me, I won't take you a long time. I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna walk you through like what I did. So this is Angular 7. I installed uh, Angular 7. I installed the CDK and then just importing my scroll um, module over here. Oh, yeah, sure. So I just injected my module here. In the component, I used the di direct, uh, the, this component and define the item size, what I need. I made the call. I got the token. I get the data, expose it over here. And there you go. That's my page here. Nice, right? But this is the last uh, minute piece that I worked on. I'm sorry for that. Uh, there are some couple of errors. So here it is. How this thing works. Can you see as I'm scrolling down and up, we are adding the nodes. Right? Scroll all the way to the bottom. Okay. How far is it to the bottom? Yeah, so I just have it, I just managed to get like 72 items of my accessories. And these, like this is this, a very small set of data that I'm presenting here. So uh, I defined my viewport and the buffer size that I, I'm gonna have this many items. And what is my buffer size? And I defined everything in the pixels. So whenever I scroll up or down, the nodes are getting added and removed as per the need. So that is the coolest thing that this virtual scroller is doing for me. And as I mentioned, it's just plug and play. I haven't done anything. There are a couple of more things that I would like to talk, but I think nope. I'm not ready for it. I want you to try <laughs> something. Can you go back to your code editor? Can you change the item size to say five? And then show the DOM when it gets there, after it finishes recompiling. There you go. We should have dropped it down to only five. Why? No. Oh, okay. Oh, I get it, what you're trying to do. You want to just show the five nodes? Yeah, yeah I understood. I don't know. Uh, so let's do this and see what happens. Maybe I'm having a very small set of data. And maybe if like we would have 10,000 items, that would be helpful. So uh, working? Yeah, okay. I'll try to explain. Um, so the virtual scroller, uh, what it does is uh, it's supposed to like recycle DOM nodes and we've got to see a, that a little bit, but uh, th this is like actually all of the DOM nodes. It's not actually recycling anything. It's just exposing some of them at a time and it's like moving them up and down, which is not like a true virtual scroll behavior. Um, what we what we would want to see is like, there'd be like three of these, right? And it would like just move the contents of this one inside of like the ones on the page as it goes. Uh, and so it has an API for specifying like how many rows it should render. Uh, by default, like it wants to fill the whole viewport, 
but it also wants to give you just a little bit more than the viewport. It wants to do a little bit below and a little bit above, just so if the user is like sort of kind of scrolling up and down just a little bit, as users do, they still can see the content and it doesn't need to re-render. Though the though the viewport is defined as twenty and the actual data we got is three, then does it inject like the the divs empty divs? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. So uh, the, you, the you are saying the interface would allow us to only have three divs? Yeah. Well, basically, it wants to fill the viewport. Uh, mm -hmm. The viewport is just as big as the browser window is. The API uh, is such that you specify how large each row is in pixels. So if, uh, let's just say our screen was uh, a thousand pixels tall uh, yeah. and our rows were 500 pixels tall, then it would like want to do two rows to fill the viewport. And then it would also want to do a couple supplemental rows uh, above and beneath. That, that's what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Um, maybe I'll reframe my question so that it's clear. So once we define the view port, whatever you're mentioning, like the rows and the columns, right? The space. Yeah, the, the viewport uh, is not defined by us. The viewport is just the, the, the browser. The browser yeah. yeah, but we got back only one item. Then how does this virtual scroller behave? Will it fill up the with the empty. Oh, if there's only or, one item, uh, yeah. and it, what, what I, no, it'll just it'll just uh, cut off. I think yeah. you're uh, asking. Uh, will the d extra like deals when, be added? Uh, yeah. I have, for an example, I have a set of eighty uh, yeah. products with me, mm. and I have defined viewport of five of them mm. or six of them. So at at a one time, I've been displaying three items yeah. in a row, right? So uh, when I define uh, in this way. Uh, this virtual scroller is taking track, uh, it's keeping a track of count mm. and the index value. So whenever I scroll up and down, it keeps, a, it takes a buffer and it, you know, get add and uh, remove the nodes as per okay. the need. Yeah. In this case, the, we will not even get the scroller because it's just item. So my question is, yeah, the DOM, would it add this? No, it, it's not going to add things you don't need. Add. It'll okay. just have one item, no scroller. Yeah. Oh. It, it's pretty smart. Nice. Yeah. Um, the, the scroll bar will be like, it'll, it'll, have the size, like if, if you have a 10,000 items, the scroll bar will be like this big. It'll yeah. sort of like fake it as if it had that much height. Um, uh, yeah, but if it doesn't have that much height, it's, uh, it's very clever. Hide the scroll bar, it's all good. Yeah. The beauty of this tool is, yeah, so beauty of this tool is that all the events that uh, you, uh, like all the things, the general things that you perform in your daily activities, you can do all of this, all of those things. The challenge that I faced, and I believe, like I've seen, uh, it is not much compatible with the MDK grid components, uh, which is again uh, part of Angular Material. So this is what it is. Yeah, we know about the performance is affected by the downloading from HTTP call, whatever yeah. server happening, it takes a sweet time. If you have a big data, like five gigabyte data, and on the DOM, we have a bigger uh, fish to fry to attaching to the DOM. It takes a, it, does it solve this problem? You can, you can limit your window, the left-hand side of the window and the top of the row, window Mike. You can limit the, the window, what's inside the window, and above and below as your scrolling area. And then you, you have events so that as you're scrolling through, it can make more calls through your RxJS to get the rest of the data and until it loads up um, your, your store. But it only keeps those number of DOM in there. So if you were to actually load up all 400 of our 450 some accessories that we have in our store, the DOM would grow very large. And if we all remember in the AngularJS days as you got tables that loaded up and all of those bindings through it, your uh, application would slow down to a crawl. This makes sure that you keep only a, a, a limited number of rows in there and it keeps moving the data through those rows. Does it work with the tables as well? With the rows? Not yes, it works with tables and rows. And the good, the good thing is you can orient it uh, in any way, like horizontal and vertical. So uh, when you, so you have this big view, 
uh, and you're, let's say you're clicking on it, one of the items, uh, and you want it to go back, does it actually have, like, go yeah. back to the right place? Yes, it keeps track of okay. everything. Okay, that was my question. Thanks. So that's what I'm saying. I haven't done anything for it. I've just used it. And it's a very, uh, you know, useful thing that we can uh, have so it. Go back and show your view template. Which, uh, yeah. No, the template in your code editor. Your HTML. Going there, yeah. That's all there is. So that's it. I haven't done anything. Set up your RxJS, your HTTP, get your, set up the calls. Then this does the rest. It's a very awesome feature. Yeah. And is there new material or is it's a angular, angular, angular material, material, yes. Have you seen any comparisons between the Oh, is seven? No, uh, even uh, uh, what's the version of material? Angular seven. Seven point three. This is seven point three. Have you seen any issues with the browser compatibility? Uh, the good thing is Angular is compatible with specifically with Google Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that Angular works on, which is generally evergreen browsers. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Prabhjot. Swagmaster, what do we have for him? And Tulasi, can you swap out? I wasn't ready, sorry. Um, we have a second t-shirt. This time you can look like a magenta Captain America. Also a size large, sorry. So my question for you guys is what is the list or what is the collection of tools that are built into Angular Material that you can leverage Virtual Scroller with? Someone who hasn't gotten swag yet maybe? Yeah, yeah. You look like you have a thought. Yeah. What's up? Material CDK Virtual Scholar. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was an easy one. <laughs> okay, how y'all doing? I know that the, uh, the the mind can only absorb as much as the derriere can endure. So can we all stand up and give it a little shake? <laughs> Come on, stretch, shake, okay. We got one more. Well, I'm just wasting time here while he gets all hooked up. <laughs> um, so questions for you. How many people here do functional UI testing? Who does E2E testing on your web applications? One, huh? Only one. Do you have somebody else that does the testing for you? Okay, so how many people's applications have tests that do UI functional testing? Only two people. Wow, scary. Okay, so how do you know that the, um, after you've built and deployed your application that it actually works? <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about evolution of functional UI testing here. This is Tulasi, very long name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and he's our it. SDET expert. And uh, he's been working with us on the Shop Owner Project on how are we going to do our functional UI testing. Anybody heard of um, Protractor? Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. Anybody use Protractor? On AngularJS, of course, right? Anybody use Protractor on Angular 6? Mm, okay. And anybody heard of Cucumber? Yeah, anybody use Cucumber with your Angular tests? Mm, okay, so I love Cucumber. Uh, can you show us the rally story? Why do I love Cucumber? Rally story. Uh, there we go. No, 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 there. <laughs> He's searching. Sorry, I'll open. Oh, no. Okay, so our um, product owners 
write our acceptance criteria into our stories that we, for our features that we work on. And they use the given when then syntax. Given this, when I do that, then I should see this, this, that, and the other thing. And that's how they're actually writing our acceptance criteria. That directly translates over to the Cucumber format. Um, so if that can directly translate, I can actually get my product owners to write my acceptance criteria, my acceptance tests for me, and then just execute them. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing. So this could be um, executable code right there. So now show us the code editor with uh, yeah. just the Cucumber code editor. The Cucumber one. Okay, look familiar? It's kind of the same. This is why I love it, because it makes it very accessible to our product owners. So I said, great, we want to use Cucumber, but wh why do we use Protractor when we do Angular testing? Well, Protractor is two things, right? What are the two things that are Protractor? One, it's a test runner, of course. Two, it's it supports extensively. Not but you. You know everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a library. It's a library that allows you to interact with Angular applications. It knows how to wait for the application to load when Angular is done uh, rendering the page. It knows how to give you access to um, ng repeats and stuff like that. OK, so we wanted to use Protractor uh, with uh, Cucumber so that we can get this kind of, and that was working great for us when we were on AngularJS. Now we switch to Angular. Yeah, it is, it is, still it is good, but the problem is that it, it depends on other uh, third party library that is called WebDriverJS. So when the, those people not updating with the latest changes, these people cannot uh, update in Protractor. So always they have to wait until WebDriverJS release something for these guys so that they can come up with. But Selenium is evaluating day by day. It is moving forward very fast that, you know, uh, recently W3C recommended as a web automation tool, Selenium officially announced last year, June. So that means they, 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 they are bringing up some more uh, uh, commands which is required for modern web applications that they, they identified and they uh, made it as a standard. So Selenium is up, getting updating to uh, the uh, uh, to compete with modern web applications, but when Protractor required to uh, implement those, first they have to wait for WebDriverJS, then they have to come to the Protractor, then we have to use it. So that's the challenge we have, but it, it, it supports extensively that, you know, whatever Selenium does, that cross-browser testing, multi-device testing, all those things, except that native applications test uh, uh, automation. So in the end, Protractor is great for working with AngularJS but it starts to fall apart when you're working with Angular and Angular 6 and Angular 7. So Protractor's out the window. Well, I still like Cucumber. Can we just use Cucumber? No, I don't. <laughs> Why not? Because... Uh, Why can't I use Cucumber? Yeah, it, it's great to write test cases in user, user language that, you know, we don't need to write test case again. We can just copy from Rally that uh, who written by product owners itself, then they can read test case as well. These all are great features, but in terms of execution, that is cr crucial for us. So mm -hmm. I went to SAS Labs. Uh, Sa Anybody you heard know? of SAS Labs? Two people. What okay. is SAS Labs? SaaS Labs is a cloud execution platform. That means they can provide a, a Selenium grid approach that you can uh, do cross-browser testing, you can do multi-devices uh, testing, you don't need to have your own infrastructure, you just plug into that and you can uh, execute in parallel, you know, if you have thousands of test cases, you can run in parallel all of them, you can finish within five minutes or two minutes in the, uh, to require this CACD models nowadays. So that service they provide. So since they are uh, monitoring all these test runners, like uh, Cucumber, Nightwatches, and uh, uh, Jasmine, and uh, Mocha, and TestNG, all these things, they categorized. They, they noticed that Cucumber has some problem that, you know, when there is a large suite, then you, you can never expect that uh, you know, 
how many will fail in that? There is no reason for failures, but it will fail some, some of the test cases. Oh, come on. So you're telling me when I get up to three, 400 end-to-end uh, -end tests, my user scenarios, that when I, and I try to fire them off at Sauce Labs uh, in a Selenium grid and hit uh, four different browsers for all of my 3,000 tests, Cucumbers is just going to fail randomly. Yes, you can, you can expect that 5 to 10% of failures unexpected. That's unacceptable. So there's got to be something else. What else can we do? So that's what... Uh, By the way, this is a cucumber test. This is uh, a home, the, the page object, and then this is the steps. This is how you actually write cucumber. Yeah. The same thing that, you know, in, in other frameworks like Mocha, they also support this BDD. BDD is the beauty in this cucumber, mm -hmm. that you can write English statements. The same statements still you can write in in uh, Mocha BDD. You can use Mocha. It, it doesn't have that kind of problem okay. since it is lightweight. But, but what about this tool that the Narwhal is talking about? What about Cypress? Oh, like, yeah. what, what about that? Yeah, it's, it's a great tool that we don't need to, we don't need to wait for anything. The, the biggest challenge in automation. What does it look yeah, like? Sure. Okay. This is, you see my code, I never kept any wait, wait, wait stated statements here. The coding also very simple with one line code. This is, this is great. It doesn't stop. It will run correctly, but. Can you run it for me? I'd like to see that. Sure. This is not actually Jasmine. This is a mm, Cypress rendition of Jasmine yeah, in which they kind of wrapped around the web driver uh, itself and added their own matchers and assertions. Yeah. Cook, um, Cypress comes with that, you know, uh, command line runner as well as this UI runner. So I, I picked up this to show that how it runs. If it is headless, that we can't, we can't see anything. So let me run that my test case. Add to cart. It opened up. It shows that left side, what it is happening in the site. This is interesting. Write. I'm seeing every XHR that's happening in the web application. That'd be interesting for debugging my app. Ah, you got some failed ones. No, it won't fail. It it is. It it has its own retry mechanism. It it fails at one place. It will retry again the same statement. So those are not my test. Those are my application under test. Yep. So we don't we don't need to worry about that failures, but it will it will keep running and it will. You're doing a heck of a lot with this this uh, user scenario. Now you're going to choose the 128 megabyte or gigabyte option. You're going to choose no credit check option, and you're going to click add to cart. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I noticed is that you know when I started with this, with there are two browsers this Cypress is providing. One is Chrome, and another one is Electron. If if I start this same test with Electron, it may run faster than this one. <laughs> okay. So with, with Chrome, again, it, it little suffers, but the advantage is that we don't need to write synchronization um, techniques that you That's it, pretty it cool. can handle. So how about me uh, being able to run my uh, suite of 3,000 tests? I need to oh. be able to run them all very fast. We, I, here, the other challenge is it can support only one browser, one instance. You can you cannot do parallelization, but you can do when you have Docker containers like you know uh, with multiple missions. In one mission, you can use one like that. If you provide that kind of infrastructure, then you can do. But it's it's heavy thing. So in my old days of doing Protractor and Selenium uh, web driver, I was able to create my suite and throw it at Sauce Labs, and it would split it up into a grid and automatically do that for me. But you're telling me I have to manually go and create a whole suite of Docker containers and split this thing up manually. I'm creating my own damn Selenium grid. You hear yes. What you're again, again, if you want to run that parallelization, I think you need to have some license from the Cypress. A license? I have to pay for it. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, without that dashboard, you can't see that results and all. You have to you have to pay for that. Oh my goodness. Okay. No. 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 Can't can't do it. Okay. Do we have any? Is there anything else that I can do that might help me out here? Yes. Uh, the same thing that you know uh, there is a, a puppeteer which is released by Google Chrome developer developer uh, Chrome developer tools team. The Dev which, Tools which, team, which they, behaves they similar to this, it is mu much faster than this one. Since it, it directly work with the uh, Chrome API, actually we have to slow down that one. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> now that's a good thing. I have to slow <laughs> the tests down. They move too fast. I got to see this. I'm gonna kill the first test here, over here. Yeah. So the same test case I written here. So this does exactly the same thing as we were doing in Cucumber and exactly the same thing you were doing in Cypress. Exactly. But this is so puppeteer. if you see, uh, other than Cypress that here I have for every statement, I am waiting for that uh, uh, locator, then I am doing some operation on it. That means I have to handle that synchronization. That's the uh, little tricky thing here, but it, it works great. That was the nice part of Cypress is that it handled all of that waiting states for you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here it is pretty fast. That's what I kept that, you know, to slow down that, can I see that what is happening in that uh, execution? That's what I, I slow down with three seconds, four seconds in, in every statement. So let me run this. Oh, oh, not in there, not in there. You put a, 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 an R in the wrong place. Line 24, take that R out. Oh, sorry. It opens up its own Chromium, which is uh, bundled with Puppet. What do you mean, its own Chromium? It's, it's a Chrome version of a uh, uh, browser with API, Chrome, Chrome API. What are you talking about, Willis? Uh, Anybody get that? <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me that it bundles its own web browser inside of the Puppeteer tool? Yes. Oh, boy. OK. Seems to be moving pretty good. I'm getting some nice little output. You see that output how time. much time it is taking as well, so it is, it is showing there how much time that statement is executing. Some nice reports. Yeah. OK. I mean, it, it sh shows for each condition or yes. your test yes. how much time it's For example, step. here you see, to s since I wanted to see this, it is really moving to the card page or not, I kept seven seconds as delay time here. It took only six milliseconds to do that job. So that's pretty damn fast. If I, if I remove all these things, even we can't see that uh, uh, really, is it doing something or oh, not? Oh, you slowed it down just so we could see things happen. What's Sneaky little. Browser engine made of? What'd you say? What's the browser engine combination all targeted <laughs> render or Angular or front end applications? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this was developed by the uh, Google. Chrome Dev Tools team, the people who wrote Dev Tools for your Google Chrome. So you think it's got some pretty good bindings into Chromium? Okay, so now it's running it without your slowing it down. Yeah. By the way, this for, is hi for hitting our load, live website. Yeah, for page load, it will wait until page load complete. Mm -hmm. Then actions will be very fast. You see, other statement doesn't take any time at all. Done. Okay. So I think I can get myself three, four hundred of those tests running in a pretty good order. Yeah. But, so but let's use that one. But the challenge with this, it supports only Chrome. There are no cross-browser testing. There is no mobile support so far. So. So why do I care? You need since since let us take 
T-Mobile. T-Mobile customer traffic is 80% almost on, depending on Chrome and uh, uh, Safari browser. Safari? Safari. Mobile, mobile Safari, 25% uh, or something. Sorry, 25 and 15% mobile, uh, sorry, desktop Safari. Like this, the similar more or less with the Chrome as well. So, so you're telling me that 80% of our traffic is split 50-50 between Safari and Chrome. Yes. And that's split about 25% to mobile and 15% mobile and desktop. Desktop. So we wanted so to check that all these four different. The other 20% is just every other damn browser in the world. Yes. Edge, IE, anybody still using that? Firefox. No, yeah. Conquer, <laughs> Opera, all the ones that nobody wants to use. So uh, Chrome and Safari are the ones that I have to test on to make sure because uh, they both have different JavaScript engines. They both have uh, different uh, DOMs. OK. So this won't work. Right. What can I do? So that's what uh, uh, we saw all these evaluations, right? That in uh, Protractor, we saw some challenge. In Cucumber, we saw some challenge, and these two tools we have we have seen some challenge. So, but this is so pretty. And oh, by the way, didn't you have like performance and, and accessibility in here built in? Oh, yeah. Can you that show is, me that? That is inbuilt features. I just want to make people cry. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is my accessibility test. I'm going to that uh, page, home page. Then I'm running one command to uh, pull the accessibility uh, limitations in. The, yeah, one line of statement. So it gives you the performance report of how much time it took to load and be accessible for users. No, this is watch. This is just, accessibility. Just watch. <laughs> okay. Run it. So what, what just happened? Sorry, it didn't run. Debug, something like that. Oops. The uh, demo gods have struck again. So it will actually go through your entire website, and it's going to use a tool to assess the accessibility. Do you have all of your um, screen readers? Are they going to be compliant? And are, is the keyboard navigation, things like that. And it's going to give you a report about how good you are doing with your accessibility, which is a pretty important thing these days. Um, what about the uh, metrics and performance? No, no, I think I oh. gave a wrong command. Oh, he's doing another one. OK, skip it. Performance metrics? Yeah. I have seen this work, actually. No, it worked. So what's this going to do for me? It will bring that entire uh, uh, page weight that, you know, how many listeners you have, how many elements you have, that how much time it is taking to load this overall page weight, it will let you know where you can reduce to speed up your uh, page. Hmm. Layout duration, recalculation, script duration, heap size. Wow, that's a lot. I've never seen that information in a test output. Right. And what about performance? <laughs> It will give you how much time it is taking to complete that loading thing. Oops. There so it th is. It is. It failed because I, I expected 10 seconds. It took more than that. <laughs> you need to make a larger threshold for T-Mobile. But it's only giving the performance on that Chromium browser. And that yes. browser is is so fast. And if our application is, I can't take that as a metric because <laughs> if.
that is on that it takes 10 seconds and think about a browser that's not close to this it would be more no. he's absolutely right no, uh, i don't think so because uh, that is fast when to click operations uh -huh. it is it is working with core uh, chrome api whatever we are seeing in the browser it 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 plays role with the api so in performance case it, it doesn't matter it will it will bring all the weightage of that uh, page and it will it will show how much time it takes to load so i don't have to be worried it right. takes 10 seconds more or less more or less the same i mean if it takes 10 seconds here more or less it takes 10 seconds on the regular chrome browser right but we come back to our our main uh, proponent here or uh, opponent here is that it only runs on Chrome because it was written by you the see? DevTools team of the Chrome browser. Last time it took more than 10 seconds. This time I given 20 seconds, but it, it came eight, eight, eight seconds, eight plus seconds. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> can't use Q, uh, Protractor because that it's using an, um, uh, WebDriverJS, which is kind of being deprecated. And Protractor is in... in um, active development and it doesn't work on angular 7 uh, very well so we can't use cypress because we can't run tests in parallel and only runs on chrome and we can't use puppeteer because it only runs on chrome what am i missing there is a uh, uh, recently uh, released with great version that you know I, I initially talked about uh, uh, recently selenium uh, recommended by the w3c and with additional commands which is required for modern websites there is web driver io it's it's a tool that you know that that picked up uh, even uh, selenium core it's uh, itself is not picked up that web w3c commands these guys picked up and they released it last uh, december so it, it has advanced features that, you know, we don't need to write special code to work with SAS Labs. We don't need to write special code to work with uh, 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 other, other uh, cloud tools. providers. So it, it has DevTools, DevTools support that we can do performance accessibility, whatever we wanted, whatever Chrome is supporting, it can be done. So there are many additional reporting services and, you know, uh, uh, that uh, our local uh, Selenium grid support, if we want, that we have uh, in T-Mobile, that CX Labs has our own uh, Selenium grid to run on mobile devices. We can simply plug into that and we can run it. Can I see some code? Yeah, sure. Uh, Here you go. So this is, I implemented. That's Cucumber? No, uh, I'm going to close that. So Cucumber, we don't want. That's what uh, we implemented through Mocha. This is the, the same scenario I, can, I implemented here. Uh, here, this page object model I implemented, that page objects are in this home. Then I'm, I'm just calling in this test case these, these things. So, so I can run this. This is Mocha being run by WebDriver.io. Okay, now Mocha I'm familiar with because that's the most commonly used uh, test runner for Node.js applications. Right. Let's say, uh, yeah, Mocha, Mocha is familiar that, you know, it, it supports even unit testing, right? So people already who are working on um, unit testing, people can understand easily that so by the developers. the same framework I'm going to use for my unit tests as I'm going to use for my end-to-end -end -end tests. Right. And my integrate so every good thing is going to be the same framework. The only difference is I got this WebDriver library right. added. Right, that's it. That's pretty cool. So uh, what I was talking about this, you know, uh, just we don't need to write special code that I wanted to work with SAS Labs. I just need to provide these configurations here, that my access key and this, then then it will connect to the SAS Labs. We can, we can do that uh, whatever testing I mean the I'm putting this multi browsers here whatever I enable that it will it will pick up parallelly to run with this Firefox uh, Chrome Safari uh, Android iOS at a time so the same way that you know uh, if I wanted to run mocha just I wanted to put I, I have to pick up that service which service I wanted mocha is the framework 
If I wanted to go with uh, Jasmine, I just need to put Jasmine here. That's it, it will run. So WebDriver is the, uh, the test runner, and yes. Mocha is just the test framework. Yeah. Gotcha. So uh, let me run. Uh, oh, I got this right. If I if I write some, I have some Node.js uh, things that I have to write. If I'm using a Happy JS or some other Node.js stuff, I'm going to write my tests in Mocha. If I want to do some unit tests on my Angular code, I'm going to probably run them in Karma using Mocha. And then I want to do some end-to-end -end tests. I'm probably going to use the WebDriver I/O running Mocha. I like the synergy. What's happening? It opened up browser. It clicked on shop once. Anyway, you can see a report output of this. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it won't show up anything. I'll wait till the end. Huh? <laughs> click on 128. Yeah, actually, that uh, log no site is able. Yeah. And we're not. Add to cart. Oh, you click on add to cart. Oh, and you're going done. to okay. cut until that I return. That's and it. you had some way for me to review the reports? Yeah, it is there. Uh, I had to run that, uh, run a reporter. Then I could see that. See comments what I written. Ooh, that's a lot of scripts. Mocha local report. Oh, that's interesting. I'm gonna want to know more about that one and that one. Yeah. Again, it. Uh, so what the Sauce Labs report is gonna run the same tests in Sauce Labs. Yes. And then the CX Lab report. What's that? Uh, CX Lab uh, is devi real devices that we are not having that uh, permission from the SaaS Labs. That's what we wanted to use real device uh, validation. So uh, if we connect to the Appium, then it will connect to the uh, our CX Lab uh, uh, matrix. Then it, it can run the same test in real devices. So upstairs on the second floor, um, our CX Lab, they've uh, did a little experiment and they said all of these phones that people trade in to upgrade their phones uh, some of those phones they just can't sell they can't resell them can't do anything with them they said oh we'll just give them to them so they, here's a box of used phones they said okay and they hooked them all up to these raspberry pis and connected them up and created this thing called device matrix and then they hooked it up to the internet and gave it some tools so now we can run all of our tests directly on physical devices choosing the devices we want to and run them all in parallel on actual Android and iOS devices and get real live results of what it will look like uh, when run there. So we can run them on desktop through Sauce Labs in parallel, and then we can run them on CX Labs on physical devices to get real results there. And you get some nice, pretty reports. Right. Um, where do you see the this same report when you run on the CX Lab or the Sauce Lab? It can generate in this report itself. No, do they give a URL to go to that Sauce Lab website and? Oh yeah, uh, I, uh, Sauce Lab providing web UI. I can see while running itself. Uh, the same way CX Lab also they are providing mobile device. I can see uh, how it is running in the mobile device. Mm. So uh, I can see parallelly, par uh, and also it comes in reports with screenshots, videos, all those things. Okay, sweet. So uh, 
Yeah, let me explain this. This is our uh, uh, CX Lab uh, dashboard. I mean, dashboard. Yes. this is the real device. Is a physical. This is a snapshot, a vi movie snapshot of what's physically upstairs on a Android device. Yeah, that's not emulation. It's not emulator. It's, it's actually exporting the video from that device. For this one, I have to start uh, my IPM server to connect to that. I'm starting IPM server. ready and then Did you start Appium? No, I forgot commands what I did. <laughs> Mocha CX Lab report, yes. Okay. It started if I go to one of them. Uh, they all look the same from here. Is that where it's running? Yeah. It's done. No, it is. Didn't get to see it. That's Cyprus. Oh, this is Cyprus one. Sorry. It, it started here. Oh, it's starting to run the test yeah. on a physical device, exporting the video to us, and also creating a recording that we can use to reference later if we ever want to look at it, the problem. I love all these tools they give us too. Yeah. That's the team upstairs, they created this tool. Exactly, we developed that, uh, what we are proposing, Selenium Grid and Appium Integrated. They've already grid. finished it. Yep. They're just waiting to teach it to you. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can seamlessly use this one. <coughs> So what we're saying is that now that they've uh, finished getting Selenium Grid in integrated, we, we can fire off um, a dozen tests all at the same time against different devices. Right. What's it doing? It, it is slow, mobile d real devices, right? So <laughs> <laughs> again, yeah, it's, it's slow. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so I was curious, does Mocha have a convenient way of supporting accessibility testing? Oh, yeah. No, accessibility is, Axe Core is the library, that the, those are the people come up with this accessibility thing. We can integrate pretty much with any, any tool or any language that I integrated with this web driver uh, IO. It, it supports well on that. So. I think I can run that. This is the results yeah. from your CX, the yeah. CX lab test on an Android device. Right. So uh, accessibility as well. So anybody you ever use um, Pally or Ally? Yeah. A11Y for accessibility testing? No? This is one of the tools out there, but the core to that is a tool called Axe Core. And that has a direct uh, library integration with Mocha. There's another tool out there called Apply Tools, which allows for visual difference testing. Does anybody know what that is? So that when your page comes up, you could take a baseline of that, and then the next time you run it, it's going to visually test if anything has changed on it. But it uses machine learning and AI to test the page 
as a user would look at it, say, I know there's supposed to be a picture here. I don't care what it is, but there's going to be a picture there. There's supposed to be a, a header here, and I might test what's inside that header. It's not a pixel match. It's actually reading it as a user would. There's a direct library for that into uh, Mocha and WebDriver IO. And then uh, performance testing is also. So we can do all of those things with, with these uh, libraries and frameworks. And run them against Sauce Labs and CX Labs. So we have full run testing. Now on top of that, this whole dance that we've been doing, to see I've, I've been doing this dance for s the last six weeks. And we looked at each of these frameworks. What's what can we do with this? What does it look like? Is it going to fit our needs? No. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. And we found out that settling on Mocha with all these libraries allows us to get the best performance, the best bang for the buck, the best coverage of our tests, and also have our developers only learn one framework, Mocha. You do Mocha Chai Sinon from unit test, integration test, end-to-end -end test, Node.js test, all the way through. So they learn one way of testing, and it's just the differences when you're in end-to-end uh, -end test, you're using a, a browser um, object that you import, which is the WebDriver I.O., or you're using the eyes method for Apply tools and just adding an extra line to your test. Yes. Accessibility ran here because that failed because there are accessibility issues. That, that four issues it is showing up in this page, so it's got failed and it generated that report. Don't, don't test our separate accessibility. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just want to ask, uh, like these days uh, we have gestures, you know, uh, Gestures on devices? Yes. Good question. So can we test those? Um, that is devices. We can't. The, anybody? Just, I think he means like spread to. and pinch. Spread, pinch, two finger swipe. Uh, I'm not getting. Uh -huh. Right, right. Uh, so I don't. I think this is word out of the box, but I know that uh, CX Labs upstairs, they have built what is essentially a robotic hand, uh, and I don't, I, I haven't used it. Um, I am pretty sure uh, it's only points and click right now because it sort of uh, goes into the WebDriver APIs and the ones I'm familiar with just do click, um, but I think it's extensible enough that it could support it, but I don't know. I don't work on that team. I just, I don't, I don't think it'd be easy. Yeah, these are set of uh, uh, rules, accessibility rules that, you know, it, it, the magic is in uh, uh, CSS that if we are missing something in that, the tools will catch that it is not able to read that properties, whatever we wanted. So what we are doing here, we are scanning that entire CSS. We, we are making that there are duplicate IDs, there are duplicate text. You should not put that you are missing uh, text here, all those things. So how we can use this when, while development itself, we scan this and we can figure it out. We can reduce maximum amount of issues while development stage itself. When you push that to the uh, real uh, device testers, there must be, there be, there are hundreds of uh, readers that we can't test with everything, but at least we can so uh, solve many majority of the problems. That way we can give it to UAT, then if there is anything missing in it, they can find out. Otherwise, if there are hundreds of issues, then human beings cannot concentrate on it and read every time to figure it out what is wrong with it. Any other questions? So we've been talking about that robotic hand a little bit, which is really cool. Uh, not many people in the world have it. Like Sauce Labs has like their own variant. T-Mobile has their own variant. It's very cool. So I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but uh, recently uh, one of Huawei's uh, top executives was uh, arrested in Canada. Um, and one of the reasons that she was uh, arrested was for stealing intellectual property. Um, and what, uh, like, one of the well-known intellectual properties that she's being accused of stealing is uh, she was brought into T-Mobile and she was shown this automated testing tool, you know, the hand testing real devices. And that's like, one of the key reasons that she's being detained in Canada right now. So, very cool. No, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm, remember, I'm remembering now. Actually, in my company also, that kind of USC we did, that when, when we uh, lift our hand, then it will, it will pick up something. That kind of automation we did. Yeah, I did not get, when you mentioned gestures, I did not get that. <laughs> That's true, it's there. Yep. So when you evaluated all these tools, did you try Test Cafe as well? Test cafe. 
Just keep it. Yeah. yeah. We, we did through some of the blogs. People already moved out of test cave, the test cave and they are moving to Cypress. Then they are moving to Puppeteer. These, these things are happening. So we did not try with it. So tell me again why, why not Protractor? No. I'm just curious. Uh, I already told that Protractor has great features that, you know, with Angular, seamlessly it supports. Mm -hmm. But it, it depends on WebDriver.js. Yeah. yeah. So it supports both, though. It, 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 suppo it supports. Except for, like, the model stuff, which is very specific to AngularJS itself. So I, I, we test Angular apps all the time, so with Protractor. Oh, is that? Hey, uh, yeah, it works well. Uh, it gets, it's fine. Uh, but basically, it's become a burden to maintain for the Angular team. Um, and so I was talking with Alex Eagle, who's now the CL of like the CLI team. And uh, at as of like ng-conf last year, um, they basically it, it just been on maintenance mode for the better part of two years. So it, it's not getting things like adding mock modules, you know, all the features it used to have. So like it works it, and it's fine. It just like it is basically on life support, and that that's fine. But these things aren't, they have like a, a capitalistic incentive to improve their products, whereas the Angular team doesn't have any incentive to improve Protractor, but merely maintain it because it's their test runner. So these things will get better over time, but Protractor likely isn't unless something changes. But it works and it's fine. You, you use it, like it's still recommended, it's fine. And as Tulis was pointing out that the WebDriver.js is the yeah. library that uh, it r depends on, which is uh, spinning up its own version of Selenium is not under active development either, whereas this WebDriver IO, which is WebDriver for Node.js, is under hyperactive uh, development. Uh, so we decided to follow where the ball was rolling. Exactly. If you see this, it supports these many things, reporters these many, services these many, Apply tools, browser stack, all these things. We don't need to write special code for this one. In Protractor, everything we have to write, we have to integrate, we have to make sure that is working, all those things. That to this this is an advanced that W3C uh, wide protocol uh, basis that you know they are they are coming out of that Selenium uh, uh, individual driver model that they are coming up coming up with uh, uh, protocol model W3C standards Pro protractor may take some time to come come to that level that you know that's what we chose since we are in research we thought how to go with this. So to be uh, completely honest with you. Um, in our Angular JS code, we're doing everything with uh, Protractor and Cucumber, and it's working just fine. Um, when we brought on Narwhal, and they were talking to us about that, I heard that it's only been in maintenance mode for the last two years. I got nervous, and I said, "We need to look at what else is out there." Narwhal has also been uh, promoting Cypress pretty heavily, and I've listened to it on podcasts. If anybody listens to Angular uh, Adventures in Angular, um, there was a guy on there talking about Cypress, and then lately, Narwhal's Connect talked about Gleb. Uh, about Cypress. And so we looked at that as well. And uh, we're trying to evaluate each one as we're going through. We even had Dan write us up a bunch of Cypress tests that show us what it looked like. Um, and we found out that about need to support Safari and said Safari, the Cypress isn't going to work for us. Looked into Puppeteer, which was a, a competitor, found out about that. So we, we went through the stages each to come down to this one. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work for you. We're just showing you what our results of our research ended up with. It works great still, Protractor. We can't say that, no. It is, it is Angular specific, actually. No, if you're using it, 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 it'll work fine for you. Any other questions? OK, Swagmaster, what do we have? Um, we have another stylish T-Mobile bag. It's been a long night, so I'll take it easy on you guys. We talked a lot about a variety of testing frameworks. What were three of them discussed in Tulisi's presentation? For the bag. <laughs> wait, wait, which framework are we talking about? Like test framework or the yeah. the framework? Now, now this is okay. So Jasmine framework. 
mocha and no you guys want like cucumber like the cucumber and web driver io and uh i guess protractor i mean you can just list them all if you want thing, <laughs> every, <laughs> every framework ever cypress selling web driver Thank you. So we um, where, where's the box of oh the back there? Yeah, there's a lot more swag in the back. There's some notebooks, socks, uh, phone rings, pens. Um, and I think you brought and some stickers. Stickers for, for Angular Meetup. Angular Meetup. Okay. Oh. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everyone. Make sure yeah, grab some swag in the back, and uh, we have our next event on. I don't know if we have a date confirmed for next month yet. Yeah, so uh, watch the meetup group, and um, we'll have the announcement for the next event there. Thanks for coming. <laughs>